Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for having me. And I hope over the next um, 20 or 30 minutes, I'll be able to give you a sense of how at AstraZeneca we're hopefully turning uh, science into medicine. What I want to try and talk about today is some of the learnings we've had over the past years, making sure that we focus on the quality of what we do, not the quantity of what we do, give you some examples of how we're transforming our science through better disease understanding, using new therapeutic modalities, as well as using new predictive models, and then finish off with the importance of collaboration and partnership. So as some of you all know, I joined AstraZeneca in 2010. And one of the first things that I did was really try and understand what it was about our research and development that had got us to where we'd got to and how we were going to try and improve um, the productivity of the organization. And if there's one lesson or one message I'd like to take away from this is that really to focus on the quality of what you do and not the quantity of what you do. Now, we did a piece of work when I first joined, um, which was aimed at really trying to understand the decisions and the data that we had at the time when we were working from the period of 2005, 2010, before I joined the company, to understand why it was that we were moving programs through research and development and ultimately why our success rates were so low. And as a consequence of all of that work, which we published in Nature of User Discovery, we came up with five key themes, something that we call our 5R framework, that we feel that if we follow, improves a little bit the probability of success of our programs and therefore improves the quality of what we do. And these 5Rs, I think, are very intuitive, very obvious, and yet for us, surprisingly important in terms of improving our success rates. The first of the five R's is the right target. How well do you understand the biology of the target you're trying to work on, the pathway you're trying to modulate, and its role in disease that you're trying to treat? And what do you do and what do your scientists do to not just strengthen that scientific hypothesis, but also try and disprove the scientific hypothesis? So that right target, probably one of the most important decisions we make during a research and development program, because it doesn't matter how good your molecules are, if you're working on the wrong target, you're never going to get a medicine at the end of it. Second of the five R's is right tissue. Understanding how much you have to inhibit a kinase or block a receptor or activate a pathway, and in what organ you want to do that and what tissue you want to do that. And so therefore, having ways of being able to demonstrate that you can actually block the pathway um, or target you want in the right tissue at the right time. The third of the five R's is right safety. Understanding your safety risks, weeding them out as early in the research program as you can, and making sure that you don't ignore them through the life of the program. Because we found inherently is that when you have a toxicology risk, it tends to manifest itself later on. And obviously, the later you, you wait, the more expensive it becomes. Right patient, again, very obvious, but to find the patient population that is most likely to respond to the modulation of that particular target or pathway. And if your molecule doesn't work in that particular patient population, sure as hell isn't going to work in a broader patient population. And finally, right commercial. And by right commercial, we don't mean is it going to be a billion dollar peak your sales drug. I mean, why would anyone want to prescribe the medicine, take the medicine, and ultimately, and most importantly, reimburse the medicine. So define the value that your new molecule will deliver, why it's differentiated, why it's important, and why anyone would want to reimburse it. And by doing all of those things, what we also found is that we started to underpin the right culture in our organization, and that became our sixth star, uh, which is right culture. Now, as a consequence of implementing all of this work, you can see the consequence of this uh, in some of our statistics or some of our metrics in terms of productivity. And actually, if you just concentrate on the overall slide, and we've published both of these papers, as I said, in Nature Abuse Drug Discovery, you can see that AstraZeneca went from a success rate of around 4% from first in man to launch to now close to 20%. Actually, right now, we're above 20%. So that gives you a sense of the improvement that we've made in our productivity going from first in human to launch. The industry has stayed largely flat. They're staying at around 4 5 6%. And so we feel that we've made significant progress relative to where we were. And of course, the challenge for us is to continue to improve and see if we can go from 20% to 25%, 30% success rates. 
we don't want to go too far because then it means we're not innovating enough. But obviously, the more productive we are, the more cost effective our research and, dollar and development spend is and the better return on investment that is for our investors, shareholders. And ultimately, the more chance we have of turning science into medicine. Now, what's nice is there's been some reports recently um, outside, in fact, quite a few reports. I'm just going to show you one of them. This is from a recent report published by Berenberg, and it just shows you where we sit on the R&D investment across pharma. And you can see that we're positioned very well relative to our peers. In terms of the R&D investment, Russia are also doing reasonably well. And then importantly, if you look also at the pipeline value of our molecules, you can see that we're doing very well relative to our peers. So overall, what I would say is that we've made good progress since the 2005-2010 era. I think we've got had a good um, decade now from 2010 to 2020. And now the challenge for us as an R&D organization is to continue to improve. And what I hope I'll do over the next few slides is show you some of the things that we're working on to make sure that we don't ever become complacent or ever take it for granted that we're good enough. Every year we need to try and improve our productivity, the quality of what we do, and continue to strive to turn that science into medicine. So what are the things that we're working on? Well, we'll continue to want to understand the diseases that we work in, the pathways, the targets, the biology. We're continuing to improve the, the number of therapeutic platforms that we have so our entire scientists are not uh, encumbered or inhibited by the approaches that they can take. And then we want to be using new predictive models, new technologies that will enable us to hopefully improve our clinical outcomes and our probability of success as we move molecules from the research laboratories into the clinic. So let's first talk about some of the ways that we can enhance our understanding of disease. And of course, with the advent of genomics and transcriptomics and proteomics and metabolomics, there is a wealth of data now that we're generating in our preclinical models, in our, in our clinical studies, in the public domain that we have access to, that we have to be able to collate, annotate, and use and integrate to create new knowledge and information. And of course, these huge, you know, vast amounts of data enable us to hopefully start to create new disease hypotheses but because of the volumes of data, we also have to start to be able to apply artificial intelligence and something that we're calling knowledge graphs, working with companies like Benevolent, to start to identify pockets and nodes of pathways that may be important in driving disease pathophysiology in the areas that we're interested in. As a consequence of putting all of this data together, we can start to pick candidates that we're excited about, and then from that, validate them in in vitro functional genomics assays, ultimately in vivo models, and then hopefully deliver candidates that we can test in the clinic to further validate or invalidate our scientific hypothesis. The easiest way of talking about this is maybe giving you an example. So on the next slide, I'm showing you an example from one of our genomic screens where we were able to identify, this is actually a cohort and a partnership with Columbia University, where we were looking at around 3,000 chronic kidney disease patients compared to around 10,000 uh, non-seeking, non-chronic kidney disease patients, and actually doing whole genome screens to try and identify both established and novel genes that may be important in the etiology of chronic kidney disease. And from those screens, we actually identified several well-known genetic risk factors for chronic kidney disease, such as PKD1 and PKD2. But we also identified a number of novel genes that had not been identified before that suggested that they were important in driving disease etiology in chronic kidney disease. These genes we've subsequently validated, or some of them we've subsequently validated in functional genomic screens. And I'm actually just showing you one of those pieces of data from one of the novel genes that we've identified, and when we put this gene into podocytes and overexpress it, we can show that it actually impairs podocyte function, and podocytes, as you know, are important in the filtration barrier in the kidney. And so this gives us an idea that this gene could be important in driving disease pathophysiology in chronic kidney disease, and therefore by inhibiting it, will hopefully prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease. So as we talk about all of these new targets and new pathways that we hope to identify through this integration of omics data, one of the things that we have to be acutely aware of 
is the drug modalities that we have, because traditionally most pharmaceutical companies have got small molecules and maybe biologics, and those are great, but they are relatively limited in terms of the types of targets that you can prosecute. So one of the things we've been very much focused on over the past few years is how to expand our drug modalities so that we can target any biology or any target that comes out of the um, target validation work that we've been doing in our research lab. So we now have a variety of small molecule platforms that don't just include traditional small molecules, but also things like Protax. We have a variety of biologics platforms starting from traditional monoclonal antibodies to bispecifics, antibody drug conjugates. We have cell-based therapeutic platforms that can go after regenerative therapies and cell-based therapies for oncology peptide platforms and a variety of oligonucleotide-based platforms. So if we, let's say, show you the example of oligonucleotide platforms, because this is for us a very important platform. We have three in particular that we're working on, um, several of which are in partnership. So working with a company called Moderna based out of Boston, we're working on messenger RNAs as therapeutic platforms. This is where you take a messenger RNA, you inject it into an individual, the messenger RNA enters the cells of those patients, and the cells then translate the messenger RNA into a therapeutic protein. We also have antisense oligonucleotide and sRNA therapies, and these are ways of actually blocking the expression of messenger RNAs and therefore blocking the production of target proteins. And these are both very important platforms when you can't partic- potentially drug things with small molecules or antibodies. So let me give you an example of one such program. This is a program that is partnered with Ionis in the antisense oligonucleotide space, and it's going after a novel gene that we've identified as being important in driving chronic kidney disease, a gene called ApoL1. And what the graph on the left shows you is that there are risk alleles for ApoL1, and if you happen to have two of those risk alleles, you're much more likely to have rapidly progressing chronic kidney disease versus if you have zero or one alleles. And in preclinical models, we've shown that when we put those risk alleles into the animals, then induce renal damage into those animals using interferon gamma, we can create proteinuria in the model. You can see that in the dark blue bar on the graph on the right-hand side. And then we introduce an antisense oligonucleotide to the ApoL1 gene. We can significantly reduce that proteinuria in the animal model, bringing the pathology back down to normal. So this shows you the power of antisense oligonucleotides. ApoL1 is not a gene that we could traditionally target with small molecules or antibodies. Um, and it gives us the opportunity to go after a genetically validated target in an important uh, disease area for us. Another modality is cell therapy. I think I mentioned that earlier, and I'm going to focus here on particular on using human ventricular progenitor cells in the regenerative space, and in particular in heart failure. There are other areas that we're investigating for cell therapy and repair and removal of fibrotic cells. But in this instance, I want to focus on regeneration. And this is where we take embryonic stem cells, uh, convert them into uh, human ventricular progenitor cells, and inject them directly into an injured heart to see if we can actually create functional recovery of that heart and improve outcomes for a patient. And this is shown in this animation on the next slide where you can see the beating heart here. You can see in light gray the infarct that is just happening now in this patient. What we're trying to do here is go here with a catheter, inject the ventricular progenitor cells into the injured heart tissue. These cells accumulate and then insert themselves into the cardiomyocyte infrastructure of the heart, and as a consequence, start to beating and start to hopefully recover the functionality of the heart and therefore have a better outcome or an improved outcome for the patient following their heart attack. Now, it sounds like science fiction, but let me show you some data that shows that this might be uh, a reality. So on the very left-hand side, we have some experimental data from our animal models in mice, where, we, again, we induced a myocardial infarction in the animal. We inject the human ventricular progenitor cells into the heart of the animal. And what you can see is after two months, the function of these hearts, as measured by ejection fraction, is significantly improved after that infusion of the progenitor cells in the injured heart. In the middle panel, we have some very similar data, but now in a pig model where we've, again, induced a myocardial infarction in the heart of the pig. We've injected 
the human ventricular progenitive cells into the heart and you can see them accumulating at the site of damage and hopefully creating cardiac regeneration and function in that injured heart muscle. And then finally, on the very right-hand side, again, very similar data, this time in a damaged heart in a non-human primate, where again, we seed the ventricular progenitor cells into the injured heart, and we can see that the cells migrate to the site of injury, incorporate themselves into that site of injury, and improve cardiac function. So really exciting data, and, and very, very important for us. Now, I've talked about new drug modalities, but it's also important to continue to improve our traditional drug modalities. In this particular instance, I'm going to talk about chemistry. And let me just take a moment to explain to you how we run small molecule chemistry programs when we have a, a lead generation program. What happens is a design chemist or medicinal chemist will design molecules based on structure and what we understand about structure function. A synthetic chemist will then make those molecules in the laboratory. Those molecules then be tested by pharmacologists in our labs. And then the team gets together, they look at the pharmacology results, and then the design chemists get working on the next round of design of small molecules based on that pharmacological data that's been generated. Now, those cycles generally, as you can imagine, take quite a long time to do design, make, test, and analyze, about six weeks per cycle. And we probably run about 26 cycles per project, which means that any lead optimization, lead, gener lead generation, lead optimization plan will take about three years as we move from the starting points in chemistry to the candidate drug. Now, what we're trying to do using automation and machine learning is improve that process significantly. So we can use computers to help our medicinal chemist design more rapidly and more efficiently. We can use automation and computers again to help us synthesize the molecules more rapidly and more efficiently. We can analyze the data using computers. Um, we can test the data, the, the, the molecules using automation. And as a consequence of this, have the ambition of doing far fewer cycles, but also taking less time in each of those cycles per se. So let's say we can have 17 cycles per project, which means that if we run three weeks per cycle, we can maybe have a project taking between one and two years, which obviously is a significant improvement and also means we're making a lot less molecules. Okay, so let me show you some data that takes this a step further and hopefully makes it more of a reality than science fiction. So taking all of the available data sets that we have in our own proprietary databases, but also in publicly available databases, we can create our own AR algorithms using recurrent neural networks that enable us in real time using computers to start to optimize molecules without our chemists actually doing anything apart from writing the algorithms and then looking at the output of the algorithm. And what you can see in real time is the computer now starting to optimize all of these molecules and predict which ones are likely to be most potent and most selective uh, in a way that really speeds up the whole drug discovery process for our medicinal chemists. And then taking their medicinal chemistry expertise and the output of the algorithms, they can then start to give the best options for our synthetic chemist to synthesize. And when our synthetic chemists are synthesizing on the next slide, it's also important that we optimize those synthetic routes as rapidly as possible. And again, we can use both AstraZeneca proprietary databases as well as databases in the public domain to actually optimize those synthetic routes much more quickly and actually get computers to help us design those synthetic routes in ways that we could never do before. So in this particular example that we're seeing in nature, you can see how our algorithm was able to optimize a synthetic route in five seconds. This is something that would normally take a chemist days to do. And so by partnering again with synthetic chemists using computation and people, we can really think about how we really optimize this process and speed it up in a way that really transforms how we do small molecule drug discovery. And so this is actually just a picture of one of our labs in Sweden now. We can see that we have computers and robots making the molecules. We have computers helping our chemist design and analyze the molecules. And as a consequence of this, we can think we can now run design, make, test cycles in hopefully around one to two years versus three years and making a lot less molecules than we've ever made before, which obviously makes it also 
a much more cost-effective way of running a drug discovery program. In the next section, I want to talk about some of the things that we're trying to do to try and improve our probability of clinical success as we move from the research laboratories into the clinic. So there are a number of different things that we're doing, more complex cellular and animal models, thinking about how we can use imaging and multimodal imaging to improve our ability to diagnose and make decisions on our programs, how we can use quantitative pharmacology again and, and computer science to improve our ability to predict what's likely to happen as we move from the, clinic, from the research laboratory to the clinic, and finally using biomarkers to identify and select patients and define those patients in a more predictive and accurate way. So let me talk first about um, some of the work we're doing with more complex models. And this example is an example of a 3D organized model we've made using healthy lungs and cells from patients suffering with, with bronchitis and COPD. And what you can see, I hope, when we compare the left and the right models is the difference actually in the two. You can see in the right-hand model and disease model we have many more goblet cells, we have less ciliated cells, and this model looks dysfunction, it produces more mucus. And because we think it's more representative of a COPD lung, we can start to test our molecules, whether it be small molecules, antibodies, or oligonucleotides in these models to give us further proof of principle that our hypotheses are right or wrong and enable us to get hopefully better prediction as we move from the research laboratory into the clinic. We're also using imaging in a number of different ways to help us make better decisions. And actually the example I'll give you on the next slide is using something that is incredibly important in immuno-oncology, which is understanding the role of pdl one staining in tumor tissue uh, before we make a decision as to whether to implement immuno-oncology therapies to those patients. Now, traditionally, every time this would be done by a pathologist, it would take around 20 minutes. It would be quite complex and the error rate would be reasonably high. But using AI algorithms, we can do the same type of work, but also contextualize the pd one staining in the context of tumor cells and immune cells. We can do it in seconds versus days, and the error rate is significantly lower than when just done by a pathologist. And so by applying these types of uh, algorithms, we can improve the probability of actually determining which patients are most likely to respond to, let's say in this particular case, uh, an anti-PD-1 or pd one therapy, and as a consequence, uh, hopefully get better results in the clinic because we're choosing the right patients versus the wrong patients in terms of their response to the therapy. Finally, I just want to highlight on the next slide the power of quantitative pharmacology and how it can help us reduce the size of the studies and also reduce the doses that we need to use in the clinical study, which obviously makes the, the clinical study more cost-effective. So in this particular example, this is with one of our antisense oligonucleotides targeting PCSK9. The team had originally proposed running a study that was going to dose 250 subjects, but through modeling and dose predictions, we were able to reduce the size of that study to 108 subjects without reducing the confidence in our ability to make the correct decision in terms of which dose we would use. This means that it's a shorter study, it's a cheaper study, and as a consequence, we also get to make a phase three investment decision much more rapidly, which means that if the medicine is successfully, it gets to patients more quickly as well. So important stuff. Finally, I'd like to talk about pioneering new approaches in the clinic. Um, and some of the things that we've had to learn, partly as a result of COVID and the new ways of working, but partly because we're actually thinking about how to work more digitally in terms of how we engage patients in clinical studies. So thinking about how we do more sightless clinical trials, thinking about how we collect data from patients in real time without them having to come into the hospital or the clinic, and how we use outcomes that are reported by the patient to give us more confidence the medicine is having a beneficial effect and that actually payers and regulators will be excited about as well in terms of the clinical benefit that the molecule is, is giving to the patient. Let me give you one example of this in, that we're using in, in real life in one of our clinical studies. And this is a study with dapagliflozin. It's called the DAPR-MI study. And it's using digital technologies and randomized registries to enable us to test the hypothesis that dapagliflozin will be important in the prevention of heart failure and death following an acute myocardial infarction. Now, it's a big study, 6,500 patients almost. 
but it's only going to be run in two countries using randomized registries, the Sweetheart and the MinMat registries, which is a Swedish and UK registry. It's high quality um, and high caliber. And what it enables us to do is to access these patients very quickly, reduce the amount of time they have to spend with investigators and physicians because they're already part of a registry, so they will participate in the trial as part of during their normal clinical visits. And through the apps and digital tools that we're using, we're able to monitor the, those patients remotely without having them come to clinical trial sites or hospitals. And so we can actually measure whether the drug is working or not through this remote monitoring. We also have incorporated digital tools into the pill boxes, which helps us determine whether the patients are adhering to their medicine because we can tell when they're taking the caps off the pill bottles and actually taking the drugs. So as a consequence of this, we can run a very large clinical study at around half the cost and with a reduced time frame in terms of recruitment and hopefully get an answer more rapidly as to whether DAPA can be useful in this myocardial infarction setting. Finally, I want to talk about the power of collaboration, which is something that is very close to my heart and I think is um, absolutely core to how we've helped transform our culture in terms of how we work. We have as an organization more than 1,400 collaborations around the world, and they really are all over the world. And the collaborations with academia, the collaborations with biotech, and the collaborations with peer pharma companies. And the key is that each of these collaborations is really a symbiotic relationship where we and our partner are getting something out of the partnership and enabling us to progress our understanding of a disease or a molecule or a pathway or an area of interest in a way that makes us better than the sum of the parts. In addition, we have a very ambitious open innovation portal where we're constantly trying to attract partners and collaborators through using a website that's called openinnovation.astrazeneca.com where we constantly review proposals and we've had over a thousand proposals in. We make many of our molecules accessible. We have preclinical studies that are running and clinical studies that are running where people are making use of our preclinical and clinical molecules in their research and clinical work. And we have over 250,000 compounds available for screening by academic groups or even biotechs to enable them to test their scientific hypotheses or their ideas and then come back to us with some of that data if they think it's interesting and worthy of partnership. So this portal, I think, is incredibly useful. It helps us make ourselves much more visible and more accessible, but it also opens up many of our molecules, tools, and capabilities to the external world so that we can, again, um, hopefully help people validate or invalidate their favorite scientific hypothesis. Finally, I want to just talk about inspiring our scientists and making sure we have a workforce that is one that is both diverse and representative of the population in the world that we live in. We're passionate about making sure that we have diversity in terms of our female scientists being in positions of leadership and having their careers accelerated. We're passionate about making sure that we have diversity of color, diversity of sexual orientation, that we really have a workforce that where everyone feels included and proud to be part of our organization. We make sure we have development assignments that enrich our people at every career level. That we're able to develop physician scientists by having things as chief scientist programs where we actually bring academic physicians and scientists into our organization where they can work part-time, full-time, and be part of our organization to get acclimatized to what it's like working in the research and development of a pharmaceutical company. And then we have early career programs, whether they be postdoc programs, graduate programs, or apprentice programs, that really, again, tries to enrich those early career experiences to give people enough of a flavor of what we do in research and development to enable them to then position their future careers exactly where they want to. So I hope what I've done over the past 20 minutes or so is give you a sense of how we've tried to transform our research and development and how we continue to try and transform it, continue to improve our productivity to hopefully ultimately turn science into medicine. Thank you very much for your attention.